Hello, everybody, and welcome to the ACP Data Tools and Dashboard Deep Dive webinar. For the next hour, we'll be introducing several key tools and dashboards that make the affordable connectivity program data more digestible and actionable. You'll also be hearing directly from the creators of these tools, and we hope that you leave this hour with a better understanding of the ACP data and how it can inform your digital inclusion work. Some housekeeping rules before we begin. This webinar is being recorded and the slides are available in the resource document and that will be shared in the chat. We also have a Q&A portion during the panel. If you have a question, please type it in the Q&A chat. You can find that in the toolbar where it says Q&A. And uh, my name is Pamela Pornanshi Bey. I am the Training and Community Engagement Manager at NDIA and I will be your host today as well as a co-host with Katie, but we'll introduce her a little later. Um, next slide, please. All right, so for the next hour, we're going to start off by introducing the National Digital Inclusion Alliance, for those who don't know what NDIA stands for and who we are. Then we're going to give an overview of the Affordable Connectivity Program. Um, and then after that, we're gonna go straight into the overview and demo of the different ACP data tools. And then after that, we're gonna have our highly anticipated expert panel, where we're gonna learn from the creators of these tools, where you can also ask questions and comments. And then after that, we'll wrap it up. Um, next slide, please. So here are our speakers for today. We are so excited to have Catherine Aquino with Education Superhighway, Christine Parker with Institute for Local Self-Reliance, and John Horrigan with the Benton Institute for Broadband and Society. They are the creators of the tools that you'll learn about. Um, you'll also hear more from them during our expert panelist portion. And joining me is NDIA's very own Katie. So Katie, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Katie. Uh, Nox Me Moon, and I'm a data and research manager at NDIA. Um, and yeah, I'm excited to be able to share uh, more about ACP data and how to leverage it. Um, we had great uh, response from the presentation at the community call, and we wanted to provide a space where you can hear directly from the people who created these tools. And um, I'm excited to dive in. Awesome. All right, next slide, please. Okay, so NDIA, what do these letters mean? NDIA stands for the National Digital Inclusion Alliance, and we advance digital equity by supporting community programs and equipping policymakers to act. We are a nonprofit representing and serving more than 1,400 U.S. affiliates, including 23 tribal entities and organizations in all 50 states, including the District of Columbia, American Samoa, Northern Mariana Islands, Guam, Puerto Rico, and the U.S. Virgin Islands for affordable broadband, access to devices, and digital skills training and support. And here at NDIA, we facilitate knowledge sharing forums like our monthly community calls, which is next Friday, our working group meetings, and our very famous NDIA community listserv. And after learning from our community, we draw major themes from what we've heard and align our advocacy efforts with that. So I will pass it over to Katie to give an overview of the Affordable Connectivity Program. Great, thanks, Pamela. Um, so yeah, before we dive, dive into the data, I just wanna do some level setting on what the ACP is and where it stands right now. Um, so the ACP was part of the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act passed in 2021, and that allocated $14.2 billion to um, provide a subsidy towards um, folks' internet bills who uh, are eligible to apply for that, um, which is those who are 200% below poverty level um or on certain tribal lands um and yeah as it stands 20 million households are currently enrolled in acp so it's currently it's it's really being um used and you can see that it has a huge impact on um you know people's ability to afford internet um and yeah the acp is a huge priority especially like within the digital equity community um, and there is definitely a growing concern that funding could uh, run out as soon as uh, spring of next year, um, unless Congress acts very quickly to uh, appropriate funds by the end of 2023. 
Um, and I mean, the immediate consequence of that, we can imagine um, lots of families will be uh, losing their connection to making internet affordable for their household. Um, and there'll have to be a lot of, you know, emergency responses to that. But then the more concerning consequence of that as well is that um, people who are participating in the program um, will have like their trust broken um, in the, you know, services that our government provides to them. And that might be something that can't be repaired. So the now is a really crucial time to act to make sure that every every Congress person knows the importance of this program. So um, uh, the current priorities surrounding uh, getting ACP onto the you know radar of those in Congress and um, making sure that it's sustained is to continue to spread awareness and sign up folks who are eligible for ACP. Um, the more folks are signed up and using this program, the harder it is to deny that <laughs> it has a huge impact on the everyday of lives of Americans. And um, another great uh, tactic is sharing like the success stories um, of ACP and how it helps folks connect to um, the internet, which in turn, you know, as we all know, helps connect people to, you know, health and like telehealth, online learning, um, you know, school programs, government services. I mean, just connecting to friends and family. So um, those kinds of stories are really important for your representative to know about <laughs> that this this program is having a really very real impact in your communities. So these success stories are really um, key to uh, pushing congressional representatives to refund ACP. Perfect. Thank you, Katie, for that overview. Um, I just want to remind that we do have a, a resource document in the chat um, where you can access the link to the slides as well as other links that we'll be sharing throughout the presentation. Um, all right, so we before we dive into the different ACP data tools, we want to learn from you. So we just launched a poll and we want to know what your experience with ACP is. Um, answer the poll um, and go ahead and check all that apply. Um, we'll have this pop up for about a minute or so. It's fun watching these polls because then you can see which answer is leading and it looks like it's a race. <laughs> right now it looks like helping community members sign up for ACP is uh, in the lead, which is great. We love our digital inclusion practitioners that help out with advocacy and outreach. Um, and that's perfect because we have definitely the tools for you. We are going to close the poll in just a few seconds. So answer or forever hold your peace. Three, two, one. All right, and I'll share the results for y'all to see. So again, it looks like the majority of y'all are using ACP to help community members sign up um, for ACP, which is great. Um, it's great to see how you're all um, using ACP in your organization, um, whether that is with advocating for ACP renewal or researching for um, digital equity planning or um, applying for an outreach grant. So um, these tools that Katie will share today will help you in all of your digital inclusion work and however you interact with ACP. All right, so Katie, yeah. we'll off with the first tool. Yeah, that's really great to see that uh, so many of you are working to directly help people um, utilize this program. Um, so yeah, I'm hoping to share a little bit about how data can help you you know, strategize and achieve those goals in a, a, a streamlined way. So the first kind of um, tool I'm covering is the uh, Universal Service Administrative Company, <laughs> which most people call USAC. <laughs> um, this is the administering entity of ACP, and they provide an enrollment and claims tracker, which is essentially just a spreadsheet, um, which uh, it shows, you know, uh, how many, how much ACP enrollment there is and the funding that's been claimed by the internet service providers um, 
to date. So they release that data monthly. And they have data for all 50 states and five territories. Um, and they also include data about the method of verification. So there's different ways of um, getting verified to that you're eligible for ACP. Um, and you know, one way you might be able to use this tool is to look at verification methods that have and haven't been tried yet in your locality um, to see if there's other outreach methods that could be successful. Um, but yeah, this data source is mostly just the raw data and uh, the other tools that um, we're covering today. Uh, most just use this data and combine it with other data sources in a, in a much more accessible, digestible way. So um, I would recommend this use, using this if you uh, want to like create your own analysis or visualizations. But I think the rest of the tools do a great job of making this data much more accessible. So the next one that I'm excited to talk about is the Institute for Local Self-Reliance's ACP dashboard. Um, so there's like a ton of features on this dashboard <laughs> and um, some of the key ones that I find really useful are the, um, they've created an estimate of how many households are eligible. So, you know, just because we know, you know in theory, um, X number of households are uh, any household below 200% below poverty line is eligible. That's actually really hard to <laughs> figure out exactly which households there are and what how many households out there could be eligible under different programs as well. So um, they've created an estimate and that helps show like the gap between how many are actually enrolled and how many um, potentially could be that aren't yet enrolled. Um, and they also show um, you know, a few different scenarios of when the funding could be depleted based on how, man, how much enrollment uh, changes over time. And also they show enrollment by a congressional district and conveniently <laughs> um, even show the representative's name, party and number. <laughs> that makes it quite easy to do advocacy and outreach. So I'll just demo it real quick. Um, this is what their tool looks like. Um, and you can see that the state and zip code search area is up here. And they have like a nice little heat map with who is, um, uh, how much percentage of eligible households um, has been enrolled so far. Um, this is the chart showing when funding could run out. Um, uh, the earliest predicted could be as soon as spring in 2024. And then if you scroll down, there's the map of the congressional districts as well. And I find it so neat that <laughs> you can uh, see the your representative's information right there and even their number. So you need go no further than this map just to find out <laughs> who you need to call to make sure that your representatives are aware of this program and its importance in your community. Um, and yeah, um, the, so, oh, sorry, let me go back to the slides. Um, so let's see how close you are paying attention to the little map we, so we just put up. Um, according to that dashboard, we just showed um, which state had the highest ACP enrollment rate. Put your answers in the chat, see who can get it. The answer may surprise you. Ooh, got a lot of Ohio and Louisiana. No one has faith in California. <laughs> well, those who said Louisiana, you can pat yourself on the back. We don't have a prize, sadly. <laughs> but um, yeah, according to ILSR's estimate, Louisiana has 53% of eligible households enrolled. Ohio is at 51. So, um, you know, it's a close, it's a close margin. Um, so 
The next tool I'm excited to talk about is the Benton Institute's ACP enrollment performance tool. Um, so something that makes this one a little bit unique is that um, uh, at Benton, they've created a performance score based on a statistical model, which I'm excited John can tell us more about um, during the panel. And um, that places each zip code into a category of performance um, from from high to low performing. So um, rather than just, you know, um, kind of an estimate of who's eligible, this takes in a, a lot of different factors and provides a, a score of like, is this zip code performing well or like better than expected given the conditions or um, is there more work to be done? So from this tool, we can really learn um, which high performing areas, what what's in their <laughs> secret sauce? Like, what are they doing well um, that might be replicable across different areas? Um, and then we can also identify which areas need more attention to connect folks who are eligible for the program. And another useful thing about the tool is that it um, includes demographic information, um, which can help you create a targeted outreach strategy in your area. So. Um, I'll demo this tool as well. Um, I just, I'll put in a zip code. I think this is hopefully Baltimore. Okay, great. <laughs> so yeah, you can see you type in a zip code and you can find out how many total households there are, how many eligible households. And then this predicted versus actual enrollment is um, uh, based on that statistical model they've created. Um, so it looks like they're pretty close to um, the predicted enrollment, um, but still pretty far from the total number of eligible households. So that's the kind of how you can use this tool. And what I also love about it is that you can, you know, zoom out a little bit and see what, you know, areas around you might be high performing or low performing. And um, since, you know, you can see your your very near region that can help if you know people to reach out to there and learn what they're doing differently. Um, that can be really helpful. And then the, the last tool that I want to talk about today is um, the Education Superhighways ACP Enrollment Dashboard. Um, and this tool is really neat in that it provides a state-by-state -state map. And one thing that's unique to this one is they've marked which states have a governor who's made ACP a priority. Um, and that that's a really useful tool, especially if you're, you know, working with your state office and, and trying to bring awareness around um, ACP and its impact in your state. Um, and yeah, they also have a great little um, graph that shows the growth in enrollment rates. Um, you know, which can help you think about if there was a specific like outreach program or strategy, did that correspond to a growth in um, enrollments at that same time? Um, and another thing I really like about that tool, this tool is the um, feature that allows you to aggregate, or sorry, that they've aggregated zip codes into cities so you can search by city name. So I can show you how that works. So. Yeah, maybe if we just use Maryland as an example again. Um, yeah, for, or first of all, they have these great um, just big statistics at the top, which are, uh, you know, changing um, weekly and you can track easily how many enrollments there are across the whole nation and what percentage adoption rate there is um, at this time. And if you want to know, learn more about your state, it looks like Maryland has a little star. So that means their governor has made ACP a priority. And um, you can, you know, search through the cities in Maryland, and you can even like, you know, sort um, from high to low, which has the most enrolled and eligible households. So Baltimore comes to the top there. Um, so yeah, that's, um, that is the um, high level overview of these different tools. And um, we have a full review and uh, which includes a few more tools and our recommended use of each tool 
on our blog. Um, and maybe someone can drop the blog post link in the chat. Um, but I'm really excited to hear about um, hear from our expert panel. So we will now pivot to that. Um, cool. So just to start off, um, I just would, was wondering if each of the panelists, oh, I'll wait for Pamela. Cool. Okay, cool. So for each of the panelists, could you introduce yourself and just uh, give us your context, what organization are you with and what your role is there? And maybe we can just go um, John, Christine, Kat. <laughs> All right, I'm John Horrigan. I'm a senior fellow at the Benton Institute for Broadband and Society. And I want to add that this tool was uh, developed uh, by me in collaboration with Brian Whitaker at Oklahoma State and their non golfer at University of Southern California. Hi, I'm Christine Parker, she, her. I'm the senior GIS analyst at the Institute for Local Self-Reliance. And um, my work involves mapping and analyzing data that describe internet access and related funding programs like the Rural Digital Opportunity Fund and ACP. Hi everyone. Um, and thanks Katie and uh, Pamela for having me here. Um, my name is Katakina and I'm the Director of Data Science and Analytics at Education Superhighway. Um, you know, our work really involves um, a, a big focus on really connecting unconnected households. Um, and so we do all types of data analysis that, that relate to that. Awesome. So to start out with, could you tell me um, how the creation of the tool um, that you've created was informed by the needs of you know, practitioners, advocates, like who the audience was that you identified and what challenge you were trying to solve for them? I mean, I can start if you'd like. Um, my initial motivation was wondering whether the presence of public libraries in a particular area had anything to do with ACP enrollment. And once I sort of started to go down that rabbit hole and started to talk with Hernan and Brian, we decided to build a model that would try to capture factors outside just the, the narrow bounds of eligibility to help predict what levels of ACP enrollment would be in particular areas. So we do capture uh, the public library's effect, which does have, have a positive link to ACP enrollment, but we also, and we think that is an important uh, data point for practitioners to have. But once we started to build other variables into the model, demographic um, characteristics, uh, characteristics of areas having to do with housing and housing costs, um, we, we started to, get a much richer picture of what influences enrollment. And we thought that stakeholders would want to know about those outside factors, such as the percentage of population that's rent burdened, the share of population that is foreign born, in addition to the presence of um, anchor institutions that have a link to ACP enrollment and are therefore, we think, levers they can look at to help uh, get the word out and boost enrollment in, in particular areas. Um, so it's been just over a year now since our dashboard went public and, and trying to recall how all of this started. Um, I found an email from our team's director, Chris Mitchell, uh, where he asked us to work on a dashboard that would track state spending and estimate how much was left. Um, and so we, as we dove into the data, we decided to include some other elements that we thought would be helpful to keep track of. Um, and ultimately, no one knew how long the fund would last. And so that, I think, was kind of the overarching goal of the project to start with. Um, along the way, we read an analysis from John, actually, um, that shared um, his analysis of differences in enrollment among 30 metro cities. Um, and so this piece of the dashboard felt like a great way to engage in um, some of the more densely populated engage those places in uh, like a little friendly com competition to be kind of on a leaderboard of sorts. 
Um, and then later on, we heard a lot of requests for congress congressional district numbers um, so that advocates could present those numbers to policymakers. Um, so folks like Drew Garner from Common Sense and Ariane Schaefer from Google Fiber were really instrumental in, in pushing us toward uh, creating that map. And, um, and then most recently, we've incorporated um, all the state representative information so you can easily find out who you need to contact about um, reinstating ACP. Um, you know, I, Education Superhighway, our, our mission is really to close the digital divide for, I think, you know, we've estimated that there's about 17 million households who um, have access to internet infrastructure, but are not connected because they can't afford. So with that mission in mind, you know, we really emphasize um, working with states and local governments and community partners to implement solutions that raise awareness and adoption of the ACP program. So because of all these partnerships, uh, we frequently got the question from state leaders on how their cities are uh, in their state are doing with ACP enrollment from our, our the different mayors that we work with, you know, they want to know how their cities are doing, um, what zip codes or areas that they should be focusing on and how different areas in their cities are performing. So I think, um, like also Christine said, maybe when we started this tool about a year ago, um, I think our first step really was in estimating that number of ACP eligible households you know, not just nationally, but by state. And then, you know, when we went by city, you look by county, you look by zip. And of course that even went into also congressional districts and now even county subdivisions and towns as, you know, depending on the state that you're working with. So I think our partners really just wanted to see how they're doing overall, how they compare nationally, how they compare to other states, how their metrics have changed over time. So but also we wanted to keep the tool simple um, to uh, just really make it accessible for, for everyone. So, um, so that really was um, how we created that tool. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, um, it's interesting to hear you guys mention the eligibility was a huge question for a lot of folks. Um, and it's, yeah, I, I understand why, because it seems a little, complex of how you estimate that. So um, could you talk a little bit about the kind of assumptions that went into the way you created that tool, whether that was like assumptions in your eligibility estimate or how you came up with that, or you know, if there are other things um, that went into the analysis that you guys did. We can go in the same order. Well, for us on eligibility, we used the work of Ernan, uh, who had done some analysis of ACS data to try to get a better fix on eligibility. So it's, it's relatively easy to use ACS data to understand at the zip code level, the percentage of households at or below 200% of the poverty level. But that's one part of the criteria for ACP eligibility. Other criteria include SNAP participation, supplemental security income, um, a, a, a few other things that live in ACP data, but vary by state. And so um, we just did the analysis of ACS data to include those other eligibility criteria that ACS, the American Community Survey, uh, captures, um, which came up with an estimate of eligibility that um, I think is pretty close to how Kat and her team did it and how um, uh, others have done it. So um, that for us was, you know, sort of part one of the model building journey. Then the challenge was to pull in those other variables I, I mentioned before, so like uh, percent of households rent, rent burdened and so forth, the presence of, of, of a local public library. So our statistical model that predicts ACP enrollment um, controls for the share of the population that's eligible in a particular zip code, but it also controls for those other uh, characteristics, including uh, severe poverty. 
um, which as it turns out, um, above and beyond just the predictive power of eligibility on uh, predicting what the level of ACP enrollment should be, uh, deep poverty also has a positive association with uh, ACP enrollment, even controlling for eligibility, which shows, um, this should be good news for policymakers, that um, the poorest zip codes in the United States have some of the highest ACP participation rates, which means that the benefit is reaching the target, uh, the target population that the policymakers had in mind. So like John said, um, this process has been somewhat of a journey. <laughs> um, initially, our dashboard was based, uh, our eligibility estimates were based on income alone. Um, and then after talking to other folks, including John on this topic, uh, we realized that that was actually an underestimate. So we incorporated those additional federal program households and individuals that uh, would, would be eligible because of participation in one of these federal programs. Um, so we also, um, incorporating that, we also talked with uh, Rural LISC, um, and they had uh, an, a, developed an equation that would also allow us to allow the uh, federal poverty rate rate um, to change with each uh, specific geography based on the average household size, because that is ultimately what determines the federal poverty rate. So that's kind of another little tweak in our estimate that, you know, makes everybody's estimate a little bit different, you might notice. Um, so that's kind of the additional little tweak in ours. But um, ultimately, um, we're using a, a, a kind of similar method in, in using income and program eligibility. Um, and we've used that at the state level to adjust our smaller geographies like zip code. Um, and so we apply this, um, it's a, a ratio of income um, enrollment rates to income plus program enrollment rates. And that uh, ratio is applied to at the zip code level, our um, enrollment eligibility. And so by adjusting at that level, um, it's, we're using the same factor across the state. So our assumption is here that this, it's the same across the state. We know that isn't necessarily true. Um, but the other thing to keep in mind is that while we're incorporating um, you know, income eligibility and um, federal program eligibility, it's not taking into account um, some more like localized eligibility factors like free school lunch programs or other criteria that could be verified by a local ISP rather than USAC's national verifier system. Um, so with that in mind, um, I think, you know, we're generally approaching something that's relatively accurate, but it, just always keep in mind, these are always estimates. So it's our best, our best guess of who is eligible in these areas. And I'll second what Christine said of that. It's definitely been a learning process and we really want to acknowledge a lot of people who's helped along the way. And that includes John, I think when we consulted with him about a year ago on this. Um, also reading, um, you know, uh, papers from Hernan USC. I think they made estimates, I think of EBB eligibility at the time. And so we actually used a very similar methodology and applied that to ACP, um, you know, for our data set and the assumptions that we use. So we also used uh, the census data, we use the uh, the census PUMS data, which is the public use micro data set. Um, if you are able to download this large data set, you can actually get household level uh, weighted sample data, you know, across the United States. And because of this, you can actually really create um, a rich table, like different kinds of factors that you could pull in that's available on the census. So for example, um, they have variables on, on Medicaid, um, medical assistance, on food stamps, on public assistance, SSI, on the income to poverty ratio. So you could really look at, you know, really any program such as ACP, take a look at all the different eligibility. eligibility. And, and see, um, yeah. you know, in, in creating that data set. So I think we definitely made that assumption in creating our eligibility count. Um, and, go then, on the, go on, go on, and then from there, actually, um, 
you know, we, in order to make our estimates at the city level, um, we also use another public data set, which is the Missouri uh, Data Center um, uh, GeoCore files, where you can take some of that census location data and actually map those estimates to cities. So that's how we're able to um, sort of extrapolate from like the census data to make it at the city level. No, that's that's really interesting. I was wondering how the how the city aggregation worked. Um, so uh, another question I'm really curious about is if there was a specific insight or discovery that you had that surprised you when you were looking at this data and creating the tool. And maybe just to switch it up, let's go reverse order. <laughs> Kat, Christine, John. <laughs> sure. Um, I think definitely a few insights as we look into this, but we might not um, usually publish it on our website, but um, it permeates some of our other work at Education Superhighway. And I think maybe also John just came out with, um, with a, a similar um, a paper on this on rural and urban areas. But I think we've definitely found in terms of, um, you know, both rural and urban areas are benefiting from the ACP. And, you know, I think that's contrary to sort of like this narrative that, you know, suggests that maybe broadband affordability is maybe a predominantly like urban issue, but it's really benefiting like all across like the nation. And I think if you're looking at, um, you know, the growth of ACP over time, you know, ACP has a lot of momentum and promise, you know, compared to Lifeline, which you know, started back in 1984, 1985, and has kind of stagnated and actually decreased enrollment over time, you know, ACP is really seeing an average increase rate of, you know, like three and a half percent, four percent, you know, month over month. Um, and I think maybe just my last check on the numbers, we're close to about like 20 million households that are enrolled in ACP. Um, some of our other data from our other tools, we have a Get ACP tool that is actually a mobile assistant to help you enroll in ACP. And um, from that data set, we're actually seeing that, you know, a lot of ACP um, eligible um, households that um, about maybe 25 to 27 percent of them are actually maybe previously did not have home um, internet. So that's really encouraging to see that maybe unconnected households previously um, can maybe now be connected with the ACP program. But I think like Christine's work, we've also made those projections that it looks like, you know, we're definitely going to run out of funding um, uh, sometime in 2024. And, and really, I mean, there's still, what, maybe 63% of the ACP eligible households that are still um, not benefiting from a potentially $360 uh, federal benefit that they could be receiving. So we know that Definitely, there's a lot of work done still, and we are now really also focusing on our work and supporting um, the ACP renewal process. Well, um, I kind of went in a different direction with this question, and so um, my kind of insight and surprising discovery has been in the data sets themselves and the variation in their release cycles. <laughs> um, so for those that haven't worked with this data set or you know you're looking at our dashboards, um, the there's a lot of differences. And so um, if you look at USAC's ACP tracker, um, the national and state enrollment data are updated weekly. So those are always fresh. Um, there is a zip code enrollment file that's for update, updated monthly or so. Um, but there's also a zip code uh, claims data set, um, which seems to be updated quarterly. Um, currently, that the most recent claims data ends in May. So any of the expenditure values that you see in our zip code or congressional district maps are pretty dated at this point. Um, we created an equation to estimate current expenditure for the state and national levels. So those um, elements that you see in the dashboard are um, our best estimates. Um, 
And then the other big surprise about the claims data specifically, um, and I think this has become more known lately, but um, providers have up to six months to submit claims. And so the new expenditure estimates that USAC is providing um, at the top of that tracker, um, or even in the claims data in the uh, spreadsheets that they provide are not providing the full picture of what is actually out the door. Um, as of today. So keep in mind that those are there's always a big lag for those kinds of data. Um, and so if anyone is from USAC is listening, we would love to have more regular updates of those data. Well, Kat stole a lot of my insights, but I will add one. Um, and it has to do with the geography of poverty. There's lots of work by other social scientists out there that generally finds that if you live in an area with high poverty, outcomes aren't so good for you across all sorts of metrics, health, et cetera. Um, the, our performance tool actually shows something different. I mentioned this before, but I'll go into it a little bit again. Um, we found that even controlling for levels of eligibility, which has to do with income, um, Areas where there are a high percentage of households whose annual incomes are $15,000 per year or less, which means areas with lots of households in severe poverty. Um, that variable has a positive association with ACP enrollment. So that's different than what you usually see when it comes to poverty predicting outcomes. Usually poverty is a negative predictor of things. Here, um, it shows that uh, these areas with high levels of poverty are at a higher rate than others enrolling in ACP. So that's an interesting and very different finding. It shows to me the role, the, the social dimension in enrollment in these programs. Um, it shows that um, if you get the word to areas where there are um, not just lots of eligible people, but lots of eligible low-income people, you can uh, really put a dent in the ACP enrollment rate. So that finding shows that while eligibility matters in predicting levels of ACP enrollment, um, high levels of poverty, it, that variable probably means that households are enrolling um, a little sooner than expected due to that social effect. And that actually then circles back to Kat's point about uh, the fact that ACP uptake has been quite strong um, for a program that's been around not too long to have almost 40% of eligible households enrolled is pretty impressive. And I think um, some of the findings in our predictive model um, help explain some of that. That's awesome. Thank you so much. And Kat, could you just confirm you said uh, about 25% of households did not have internet before enrolling in ACP. Yeah, and again, this is sort of a, <laughs> maybe I don't, this is probably maybe just like, um, you know, within within Education Superhighway, but it is, um, we have a getacp.org uh, tool. Um, I know it's not really the subject for this webinar, but it is a mobile assistant tool to help you sign up for, um for the ACP and we do have a question there sort of asking households you know if they have if they currently have home um, internet or not and so from that uh, small sample that we're getting from you know the the different partners that are using that tool um, we are seeing about maybe about roughly about a quarter of those households are saying that they don't have um, home internet currently and, and I would add quickly uh, based on a survey that Brian Whitaker uh, did of lower income households. There, there was a question in there about, are you a new internet subscriber? And it was a smallish sample in this particular survey, but we got about uh, 20, 25%. So oh, I, I think that number one, it squares with what um, Kat is, is talking about. And just talking with others um, sort of informally, um, to me, that 25% number sounds about right as to the share of ACP enrolled uh, households that are new. Um, new households getting online. Oh, that's yeah, really interesting to hear. Um, yeah, that this this is not just, I mean, helping people afford the bills that are already burdening them is important, but also that it's helping connect people who were not previously connected. 
Um, that's awesome. So for my last question, I want to open it up to the audience, but um, just one last quick question. Is there, a, like, do you have any use stories of how um, maybe some um, local practitioner or policy person or advocate has used the tool um, that might be helpful or replicable for those listening to the webinar? Oh, let's go the same. Yeah, John, go for it. I mean, I would say that I know, I mean, I live in Baltimore. I work with uh, folks in Baltimore on these issues. The tool has been used um, in Baltimore. I'm aware of other cities where uh, city officials have used it. Um, can't tell you um, exactly <laughs> what the outcome has been. I, I do believe it has been used in different contexts to help uh, stakeholders understand where outreach may be needed. Because if you look at the tool and the tool shows that a particular area is, is underperforming, you might target outreach resources in, in that way. I can say also that our data is available for download. So um, th that I think helps with the utility of it to understand which places might be targeted uh, for outreach. Um, so we, uh, after our dashboard went live last year, we were doing some work with uh, state AARP, AARP teams um, through a technical assistance programs to get them up to speed on internet access issues. And since they were interested in specific regions within their state, we used our zip code data from the dashboard to create localized maps um, that would highlight the areas where uh, that were exhibiting low levels of enrollment relative to eligibility. And we heard from the teams uh, that we worked with that it would be really useful in driving their on the ground work in terms of reaching out in those communities to help people understand that the program is available and what it could do for them. Um, and uh, I think for anyone that is interested in using it in this way, uh, we do maintain a GitHub repository, which is like a web page with where we share all the spreadsheets that inform the dashboard. So if and we do update update that uh, by bi monthly or twice a month. Um, <clears throat> and so if anyone were interested in getting that data, um, they can do that there. Um, and then most recently, uh, we incorporated a summary of ACP numbers by political party along with um, the state rep info. And so um, I've heard that's been really useful and um, just seeing the dashboard cited in letters from policymakers and in testimony about the program, um, as well as it, seeing it shared like in outreach group emails has been you know, just super rewarding to see. And um, it's just so great to see that it's, it's being use, been useful for people. Um, I think I definitely want to highlight a um, use case we have with our partnership with uh, Central Falls, um, Rhode Island. I think we, we've partnered with the leadership and community there, um, you know, definitely since last year. And, you know, we they launched an awareness, uh, ACP awareness campaign back in October uh, 2022. And their adoption rate has actually, um, I believe, like, um, you know, it's over six times the national rate and is now the leading uh, city in Rhode Island for, for ACP adoption. Um, you know, our work there at Education Superhighway, um, you know, really started back in late June, um, you know, and uh, had a soft launch in like August through September. And, um, you know, we saw at least like 20 percentage points, I think, increase from from like mid year to by the end of that year. Um, and I think oh, I know we're here talking about the ACP enrollment dashboard, but I think along with the city level ACP metrics that we were able to provide, um, we also through the partnership, you know, provided zip code level data. So folks. Um, they're doing the groundwork in Central Falls, can use this data to focus their efforts um, and really like uh, make a strategic impact. Um, but also really like that partnership is, you know, the data from the enrollment dashboard is really just like one piece. You know, the Central Falls team really used like a wide range of the education superhighways, like toolkits, free marketing, communication templates, really designed to like spread awareness. So 
it's really from like training uh, the community about like ACP marketing materials that are ready to go and you could put your your uh, your name on it and all kinds of toolkits and awareness campaigns that again we also provide on our website in conjunction with the with the um, enrollment dashboard to make all that possible. That's awesome. Thank you so much um, for answering my questions. And yeah, I've learned a lot from you all today. <laughs> so I just want to make sure we get to a few questions that were way back there in the chat. Um, so we had one from Rodney Hummer. Um, as, run, as funding for ACP runs out, will those enrolled in ACP continue to get funding going forward? Or is that contingent on future funding allocation? Um, I mean, yeah, I, think I think if once ACP goes away, so does the subsidy, so they will lose that $30 per month benefit. Yeah, I think that one is, is pretty straightforward. It's an urgent situation to get ACP refunded um, for that very reason. Um, and it looks like we have a question from Melissa Lassell. Um, for the ACP tool, can you confirm the definition of claimed ACP subscribers? Um, I'm guessing that refers to the ILSR one or, yeah. Um, I think they're talking about in the USAC data um, because that is in the claims data spreadsheets and, um, Oh gosh, the, uh, we actually have talked a lot about what claimed subscribers means, and it's still kind of a, an unclear, uh, unclear situation. Um, my understanding is what is in those spreadsheets and claimed subscribers is the number of uh, households that have, or yeah, households that have actually been had a claim submitted for, or re, uh, like the ISP has actually been reimbursed for, um, and so those no numbers actually don't necessarily match up with actual enrollment numbers. And so there seems to be like a mismatch and lag between the, the claimed uh, subscribers versus enrolled subscribers. And um, so we default to using just the enrollment data because um, like I mentioned before, there's like a potential six month lag in, in claims data submission. So there's a lot of, you know, wishy-washiness kind of in that data set. Can I clarify my, this is, this is Melissa LaSalle. Can I clarify my question really quickly? Sure. Um, so yeah, um, th there can be a significant amount of time between uh, a resident receiving ACP approval and actually having that number that his information accepted by the ISP and seeing the discount actually applied to their bill. And um, so I'm really interested in, in trying to, we measure that and all of the data that we gather um, because we measure all the way through seeing that lowered internet bill. And I'm just trying to figure out what numbers can I compare those to that are coming out of these reports or are there any? Can I use the enrollments versus claims? It sounds like maybe I can. Well, I can tell you in the Benton tool, the latest version, we display what the actual enrollment is. And that is what USAC says are is the number of enrolled subscribers in a particular zip code. USAC also, also in the same spreadsheet will have the number of claimed ACP uh, uh, households. And, and so we display both in the Benton tool. And there is a difference. Uh, enrollment exceeds uh, claims uniformly. Usually claims are about 70% of enrolled numbers. A, a data mystery that I have just discovered and I'm trying to understand is, because I'm starting to work on putting our tool together by city. Um, so yes, we all copy. CAP and Education Superhighway eventually. Um, but as I get the city data together, 
and look at this claims versus this enrolled versus claims, um, those numbers vary across cities. They do not vary much within cities. So um, it, I have a hunch that it, this could be a carrier effect, but I can't yet prove it. Meaning it could be the case that some carriers are a lot better at moving people from enrollment to claim. Others aren't as fast. And since carriers, you know, tend to, um, you know, one city has one carrier, other cities have other carriers, uh, uh, maybe that is part of the explanation. I'm not sure it would explain all of it, but um, there is this little mystery that in some cities, the ratio of, of claim to enrolled is like 90%, in other cities, it's 50%. I don't know why. Um, and one more question uh, that we can sneak in here um, for Kat. Um, can you break down or help us understand the data set per city? Um, how did you pick the data per city, if you could summarize that again? Yeah, and I, I'm sure probably a lot of folks on this call, you know, from the USAC tracker website, you could download the data at the zip code level and at the county level, right? But then it's like, okay, well, how do I, I want it for actually the city of Boston, you know, I don't want to go through all the different zip codes or, you know, maybe it's not necessarily the county that I'm looking at. So the way we do this is actually um, also using another public data set, which is provided by the University of Missouri. Um, um, the Missouri, um, uh, the the Missouri Census Data Center GeoCore um, tool. So it's a website, uh, there you go, thank you. Um, that actually, it's an amazing tool where again, from when, you, you, when you're using the census data, it's actually um, by location, it's by this Puma ID, which is kind of like an arbitrary like area that it has divided like all the United States. And then what this uh, GeoCore tool provides is really a way to map what that Puma ID is into what city. So it really has like allocation factors of maybe how many households are actually from, let's say a zip code to a particular city. So for example, I think uh, just a question I had yesterday from the city of Boston, you know, they added up all their zip codes, and I think it was 152 households uh, uh, difference from our estimate. And it results in, because one of the zip codes actually in Boston is that only 18% of that zip code is actually in Boston. The rest of that zip code is actually in, in other surrounding cities. So we use the GeoCore tool to kind of really allocate these factors so that for the city of Boston, we're only allocating about 18% of that zip code to, um, to Boston and then the, the rest to other cities. But that's how we go about doing it. And it's absolutely replicable for everyone here because that is also a public data set. And could you touch on how you get the eligibility per city as well? Yeah, I think um, we've identified some uh, variables on the, again, the, the census POOMS data. Um, so we're definitely using the public use micro data set. And that's really just uh, the way to, um, to be able to really use the individual variables in a census to really get the, the households that you're eligible for. And there's definitely five variables there that we have identified that are really part of the ACP eligibility. And you have uh, the Medicaid medical assistance um, variable. You have uh, the, the SNAP uh, recipient um, variable. You also have public assistance income. Um, there's a, a supplemental security income over the past 12 months uh, variable. And also you have an income to poverty ratio variable that you can set it to, you know, for ACP, it's at 200%, but maybe if you wanted to find this for Lifeline, you could change it to 135%. So like those are the variables that we used. And I think I can actually, I'll go ahead and link to our detailed methodology um, from our report. Um, I'll go ahead and link that after this. Thank you so much. And thank you to 
all the panelists can give a round of applause. This is fantastic. And um, I think everyone got a lot out of this. So I'm going to pass it back to Pamela to um, wrap up here. Awesome. Thank you so much, panelists. And um, we will share their contact information. So if you do have more questions, you can um, feel free to reach out to them. Um, so just two more things before we wrap up. First, I wanted to highlight Digital Inclusion Week. Um, Digital Inclusion Week is an annual week of awareness, recognition, and celebration that's held on the first week of October. So um, organizations and individuals across the country host special events and campaigns to promote and increase digital equity in their communities. So if you are participating, whether it's your organization hosting an event or you are participating in an event, we want to know. Visit our digital inclusion page to learn more. Join our community so you can get updates on um, toolkits that the Digital Inclusion Week National Committee is providing for you to help you with your event um, and stay part of the conversation. And lastly, we want to support your digital inclusion efforts. Um, and we want you to do that by tapping into our community of over 1400 affiliates. Um, joining as an affiliate, you get access to our monthly community calls, subscription to our popular community listserv, and you receive monthly NDIA updates through our newsletter. And I want to give a special thanks to our expert panelists. Thank you so much for coming here and sharing your expertise and knowledge. Um, and we will also be sharing the recording and the resource page later today. And I also want to give a thank you to our awesome Katie Knox Moon for being a great host and speaker. All right, we will share the recording after this call. And thank you, everybody. Have a great Friday. Bye.